Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Refreshed by the resurrection of life, we share in Christ. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace filled waters of the earth, like rains to our thirsty drink, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace in the church and we hide it here, clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us wonders of Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with life. To you we give all praise of the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
First lesson is from the 25th chapter of Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained and clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
For I handed on to you as of first importance what I, in turn, had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some are have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Beginning of something, the genesis of a new direction. 
the first step towards something more. Easter is day one of God's new creation. When the early church gathered to celebrate this day, they spoke of it also as the eighth day, both the beginning of a new week and a day totally unlike any other day. As the first day of a new time, a new era, Easter marked a fresh beginning to God's creation. The prior epoch was under the administration of the powers of sin and death. Under the rule of sin and death, the creation had decayed into a place of accusation and blame, a place of desire and destruction, violence, injustice, exploitation, and boundary became normal. The culture, religion, and the political were all subject to their reign. War making, enemy defeating, victim blaming, inequality and inhumanity, all acceptable with sin and death at the helm. Hunger, hatred, suffering, all expected and even encouraged. Jesus of Nazareth goes about proclaiming a different possibility for the world. He tells stories that open people up to a universe ruled by grace. He challenges the ways in which religious control and custom perpetuate sin and death rather than stand against it. He speaks of the kingdom of God, a different reign coming to be in the world. And he embodies what is acceptable in that kingdom. He feeds the hungry. He heals the sick. He frees the possessed. He creates community with those called outcasts. He transgresses well-established boundaries of ethnicity and nationality. He refuses to return violence for violence. He blesses those considered cursed. Of course, this campaign for the kingdom of God draws the ire of the powers presiding over the world. The political officials and religious leaders conspire to rid the world of Jesus' life. He represents a threat to the world they have created, a world that benefits who they say they will benefit. They arrest Jesus with the help of his own friend. They put on a sham trial. They crucify him with other common criminals, communicating to all that, that any who violate their vision of how things should be will likewise end up on a cross. But then three days later, the empty tomb, the confusion, the mystery, the women who arrive, expecting to find their path to carry for Jesus' body blocked by an immovable rock, only to find it pulled away. Jesus' remains are no longer there. But a messenger from God who announces that Jesus is risen. The women flee the tomb in fear and amazement, and they tell no one what they had experienced. This is how day one of the new creation of God begins. The reign of sin and death is broken, but not by executive order or dictatorial decree. Not by revolutionary overthrow or territorial expansion. It does not begin with power, but with powerlessness, with expectations frustrated, terror, and amazement, with hints that the world is heading in a different direction. Day one of God's reign of life, begun with the resurrection of the crucified Jesus does not begin with a barrage of reversals from the course of the previous reign. There are not enough hours in the day for the complete overhaul of the ways of violence and hatred. Instead, a promise is given. In Jesus risen from the dead, creation has shown God's priorities, the direction things are going to go. Our victims can no longer be expected to stay dead. The impossibilities of peace and love and welcome can no longer be said to be impossible. 
The promise is received with fear and wonder on day one. But day one is only the first of many days to come. The gift of each is the promise of possibility of a new world coming to be in every dawn. This promise of possibility comes to you and me this morning. It seems for us like the powers of sin, death, and despair still have a hold on the world. But today is Easter. Today is day one. God's priorities are still playing themselves out. The new creation is still underway. This day might begin with terror, with hopelessness, with fear. But by its end, we will experience a foretaste of the future. During the pandemic era, we have had to learn to approach things this way, one single day at a time. Making the most of a difficult day so that by its end, the care we have shown to our neighbors and community, the safety measures we have taken, the things we have believed and spoken and hoped for, might just have set us up for a better tomorrow. The dominion of death and sin is being undone today. And tomorrow, it'll be undone a little more. And the next day, still even more. The priorities and promise of the kingdom of God and the resurrected Jesus is making every day its Easter to day one. People of God, this Easter morning is just the beginning. The beginning of the new creation of God. The reign of sin and death and suffering and fear is over. We no longer have to live according to the designs of the world that put Jesus to death. But we can live in this new reign whose priorities are love of neighbor, care for our creation, advocating for justice, defending the oppressed, welcoming the stranger, creating communities of compassion, healing the hurt. With every day coming Easter, you and I anticipate the changes of the way as participants in the promise of this day one, as we are being caught up in the momentum of resurrection which will carry us into a future beyond our imagining. In the good news of Easter, the new beginning it has begun, the new era that has ushered in, inspired you to approach every day as an Easter, as day one of a new direction for our world. May every dawn signal for you the gift of this day is the first of many days when death is being undone. May the promise of the justice and joy of God's reign keep you faithful, hopeful, as we await the final day, when the promise is fulfilled and Jesus' resurrection has completed its renewal of all things. Thanks be to God.
vessel with the power of the Holy Spirit. We bring our prayer before God, who promises to hear us and answer his steadfast love. Praise to you for your power revealed in the resurrection. Fill your church with the power of your love that is stronger than death. Send us to tell the good news wherever death holds sway. Bless all servants, especially those studying to become leaders in the church, including our own Lars Anderson. Hear us, O oh God. Praise to you for your life and work in the resurrection. Fill all of creation with your life. Bring it to blossom and flourish. Use it to remind us of your persistent grace. Cultivate our care for what you have made. Hear us, O oh God. Praise to you for the peace made possible in the resurrection. Fill the nations with your peace. Draw together people of all nations and languages. Reveal new possibilities and inspire new beginnings. Hear us, O oh God. Praise to you for the hope of the resurrection. Fill all in need with hope. Those who are afraid or confused. Those who are sick or suffering. Those who are dying and those who grieve. Assure them of your promises. We pray especially for Patty Pearson, Helene Williams, Roger Harrison, Beverly Hoppe, Philip Hedges, Sonny Paul, Matt Yurantish, Carrie Burtside Harrison, Jamie Desimo, Ann Holichek, Claude Erickson, Sue Mapp, and those we named in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Praise to you for the joy of your resurrection. Fill this assembly with joy as we are called your beloved in baptism. Multiply that joy so that we share it at home and work. Hear us. Praise to you for your faithfulness, revealed in the resurrection. Fill us with trust that we join with Benedict the African and all who have gone before us in proclaiming your mercy endures forever. Hear us, O oh God. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we partake in the Lord's Supper this day, we commune in one kind, with only the bread, the body of Christ. The church has taught that the fullness of Jesus Christ is known in a single moment, a great comfort to those with allergies or for those with other reasons why they can only partake either the bread or the wine or juice. Today we join with them and trust that Jesus' promise is fully present. You will find a bag of bread in your pew, Perhaps an appeal in front of you. You may grab that down as we prepare for communion together. O 
holy, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love we sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, eat. This is my body, and who do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and we need to give thanks to give for all to drink. Saying, This cup is in covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us your spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, have thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we do for those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Receive now the bread, the body of Christ, given for you.